Have you ever wondered how multi-billion dollar companies commit fraud right before your eyes? What is the reason for them to commit fraud when they're already so well established and successful? How were they able to go off undetected for so many years? We will look at these questions based on a recent real life example and the aftermath of its corporate actions that has practically erased billions of dollars off the market and ultimately ruined thousands of families and their savings. Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome to my channel, Credit Uncovered. This is going to be the first of many future videos where we will zero in and examine a series of famous and significant corporate frauds. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about the story of Steinhoff International, one of the largest furniture retailers around the world and some of the shenanigans they've been pulling for more than 10 years. But before we get into the scandal, let's first look at who Steinhoff is and what exactly they do. Steinhoff is an international retail holding company that sells furniture and household products across five continents through more than 12,000 stores globally with over 130,000 employees. Steinhoff is publicly traded on Johannesburg Stock Exchange and Frankfurt Stock Exchange. In 2016, the company was worth 21.8 billion euros before the discovery of their accounting scandals. Since then, the company has faced an existential crisis which saw their stock value being wiped away by more than 99%. At the time of this video, the company was only worth a consolidated value of 190 million euro. The company was founded by Bruno Steinhoff in the 60s, and Bruno was a German businessman who started this whole furniture business by sourcing from communist Europe and selling to Western Europe, and the business actually proven to be very successful because essentially what he did was that he sourced all the furniture at a very cheap price and he sold it at a much higher premium and there was a demand. And what this did was that it enabled him to build a lot of capital over the years to make a number of acquisitions. In 1997, Stanhoff made its first acquisition in a South African furniture company called Gama Gama. And perhaps from this first acquisition, Stanhoff realized how quickly and easy it was to build on synergy through mergers and acquisitions because by buying out all the competitors and building a vertically integrated entity, Steinhoff was able to provide manufacturing, sourcing, distribution, and retailing all in-house. They really wanted to be a giant, and that's where they began their shopping spree. Over the next decade, Steinhoff made a number of acquisitions across multiple continents, including Timber City, Shoe City in Africa, Helen, Lippo, Harvey's in Europe, as well as mattress firm in the US. With these acquisitions, Steinhoff was exposed to both legal and tax risks. Steinhoff to create many holding companies to house these investments in order to create as many layers of protection as possible. Now the creation of these holding companies was probably legitimate without malicious intent at first. We later find out that this is actually one of the main tools the company used to commit and conceal their fraud and made it extremely difficult even for auditors and regulators to uncover. This is what the structure looked like after the expansion. Complex, isn't it? Fast forward to 2017. This is the year when all hell broke loose. Steinhoff disclosed its financial irregularities when its CEO, Marcus Joyste, resigned in December. Why would the company ever disclose this knowing that they had concealed it for years and had gone away with it? Many thought that Steinhoff was running out of lies to fill the hole that it had dug itself into. At the same time, the Oldenburg state prosecutors in Germany had long since irregularities in Steinhoff's financial statements and already began its own investigations back in 2015. Immediately following the discovery of the accounting scandal along with the resignation of the CEO, Steinhoff's stock value fell by 90% from $3.40 euro to 31 cents euro on the Frankfurt Exchange. This triggered a fraud investigation led by PwC, one of the big four audit firms in the world. This was one of the most extensive audit and fraud investigations ever conducted in the country that spanned over multiple years. Despite a final report of over 3,000 pages and 4,000 documents, PwC disclosed that they still don't know what the heck happened and that they don't have the full story. They were only able to dig as far back as 2009. And 2009 has then become the beginning of the search parameter. Now what we found from the investigation report is that Steinhoff really used four methods to commit and conceal their fraud.
Steinhoff inflated its revenue on its financial statements by fabricating 6.5 billion euro of fake sales. The company managed to do this by transacting with a number of so-called independent third parties. In reality, these were fake companies owned and controlled by senior executives of Steinhoff. These fake companies were created solely to make fake deals and buy fictitious sales from Steinhoff to ultimately misappropriate the company's assets. Of course, you must be wondering, Steinhoff would never get paid for something that never took place, right? So wouldn't the auditors figure this out just by reconciling these fake invoices to cash and notice it was never received? This is where the accountants step in. Because cash was never received, Steinhoff had to create something called accounts receivable. Accounts receivable is basically an IOU, in this case from the fake clients to Steinhoff. Because the receivables are never going to be collected, Steinhoff had to use two tricks to magically remove them off their books and made them disappear. First, they used a tactic called set-off arrangements. Recall our chart earlier in the video, Steinhoff had a very complex corporate structure by using shell companies and whole co's to control the vast majority of their subsidiaries. It used this complex structure to its advantage by passing on the IOUs from the fake clients to the subsidiaries and receiving intercompany money transfers to settle the money owed. This gives the impression that Steinhoff had collected cash from their clients, but it was really just from the subsidiaries. And because the subsidiaries were wholly owned by Steinhoff themselves, the money transfer was really just moved from one Steinhoff bank account to another. The second tactic that Steinhoff used was called reclassification. This is basically when a company relabels the IOU as another asset, for example, an equipment or a property. So how did Steinhoff turn an IOU into a property? First, what we know is that a fake client owes Steinhoff a fake IOU. Steinhoff would then buy an overpriced property from the fake client without actually paying for it. Then Steinhoff would offer to have set the payment for the property with the IOU from the client. So now Steinhoff owns a property and the client doesn't owe Steinhoff anymore. For example, there was a property in the east of Johannesburg. This was owned by one of the fake clients. It was sold to Steinhoff in 2007 for 33.7 million rand. The client had initially bought it for 4.7 million rand in 2002. That's more than 700% in price appreciation in five years. Obviously, this was a bogus transaction. But how were they able to justify overvalue properties with no actual cash exchange to the shareholders? Shareholders invest in company stocks based on its value. The company derives its value based on its earning ability and the assets that it owns. When the company's assets are clearly overvalued, they need to be written off to reflect its fair market price. In this case, Steinhoff's assets were clearly overvalued. To avoid a write-off, Steinhoff needed to demonstrate that the assets that they own are as valuable as they say they are. Therefore, Steinhoff cleverly leased these properties to their subsidiaries at an extremely high rental fee. This created an illusion that the properties are generating a very healthy rental income to support the inflated property values that are sitting on Steinhoff's books. But this also came at a cost to the subsidiaries because the inflated rent drove down their profitability and created a loss. This mattered because subsidiaries were basically a part of Steinhoff, so any loss to the subsidiary is a loss to Steinhoff. This drove them to their final tactic. Steinhoff was at the end of their rope. To make the subsidiaries' results look better than they were, Steinhoff made cash payments to fund their operations. These cash contributions were basically distributed from the fictitious sales that Steinhoff transacted with the fake clients. And if you recall, these fictitious sales were financed by the subsidiaries through the transfer of IOUs. Okay, I get it. It's confusing. Let's summarize this whole thing. Steinhoff executives created fake companies. These fake companies bought products from Steinhoff in exchange for fake IOUs. These IOUs were fake because the sales were fake, and there was never an intention to pay the cash. 
Steinhoff then had to transfer these IOUs to its subsidiaries in exchange for real payment to make it look like the IOUs were settled. Steinhoff also legitimized the fictitious sales by buying properties from the fake companies at an inflated price but offered to offset the payment with the money that the fake companies owed to Steinhoff. It then justified inflated values of the properties by charging excessive rental fees to the subsidiaries. Steinhoff, in return, made cash contributions to its subsidiaries to fund and cover those operational costs. The subsidiaries were essentially manipulated by Steinhoff executives to pull off their fraudulent activities. As you can see at this point, Steinhoff fooled everyone and basically paid themselves from left pocket to right pocket. So the big question is, what led Steinhoff down this slippery path? Well, there are two conspiracy theories. One theory is shareholder expectation. Steinhoff needed to demonstrate year over year continuous growth in sales in order to keep the shareholders happy while the executives can pocket big bonuses on hitting those KPIs and getting rich on their stock options. Another theory is that the CEO of Steinhoff and his inner circle of exec team were able to manipulate the stock market through insider information as well as misappropriate Steinhoff's company assets. They were the same individuals who owned and controlled in some shape or form the fake companies that had entered into fictitious sales with Steinhoff. They were really just thieves that misused their power, knowledge, and connections to rob the company and left the shareholders holding the bag. Unfortunately, at the time of this video, no criminal charges were convicted, even though many of them are no longer with Steinhoff, while some are involved in the legal battle. This brings us to the end of the video. I hope through the case of Steinhoff, we're able to develop stronger instincts to spot these corporate misbehaviors and be able to detect these warning signs ahead of time so that we can protect our heart and money, but I think even more importantly, our loved ones and our families. This is Credit Uncovered. I hope you enjoyed this video. This is the first time I've really been involved with uh, shooting and creating video contents on YouTube. Uh, and I have to say, it took me a very long time to make, but I'm hoping to get better in the future so that not only can I create you know, more entertaining videos, but as well as informative and educational content for all of you. So I would really appreciate if you could like this video, subscribe to my channel, and turn on that notification bell, and I'll see you in my next video. Until then, stay well.